Why is it in every single case worldwide where a child has been killed at the hands of a nurse serial killer, there are always female nurses involved? And the theory here, and I'm not saying I agree with the theory, I'm just telling you what the theory is, is that these women are harboring some unconscious hatred of mothers who can have children, people who can have a family, and there's a kind of unconscious resentment against that that is being acted out. Hello, and welcome to Crime Suspect, where each week we unravel some of the UK's most prolific crimes, as well as providing in-depth analysis on the criminality that plagues our nation. On this very special edition of the show today, trust me, I'm a nurse, we delve into the troubling mind of Lucy Letby, Britain's most prolific killer nurse. And, branded with having blood on their hands, could a crackdown on unaccountable NHS managers be the answer to preventing another cold-blooded murderer? Joining me for this exclusive in-depth analysis today are four esteemed guests. Retired consultant paediatrician Dowie Evans, consultant psychiatrist Dr Raj Passau, talk TV correspondent Holly Hudson, and retired Detective Inspector Neil Jones. Thank you all very much for being here. Now, you have the right to remain watching. This is Crime Suspect. So, she's been labelled as the carefree teenager who grew up to be Britain's worst female serial killer. Lucy Letby is serving a lifetime behind bars for her cruel and calculated reign of terror. Letby was said to have used insulin and air to inject newborns in a year-long killing spree while working on the neonatal ward at the Countess of Chester Hospital. She was convicted of seven counts of murder and attempting to kill a further six babies following a nine-month trial and 22 days of jury deliberation. You acted in a way that was completely contrary to the normal human instincts of nurturing and caring for babies and in gross breach of the trust that all citizens place in those who work in the medical and caring professions. The babies you harmed were born prematurely and some were at risk of not surviving. But in each case, you deliberately harmed them, intending to kill them. And now, in the aftermath of Britain's worst child serial killer case in modern times, one big question remains. Why did she do it? Holly, you spent a lot of time in court and you were there on the day of the sentencing. What did you think of her? What were your impressions of Lucy Letby, the person? Well, look, I think this, this case has shocked, saddened and sickened the nation for, obviously, a number of reasons, not least because of the disturbing nature of these crimes, the gravity of these crimes, the victims themselves, of course, being some of the sickest, most premature baby in the country, but also, of course, because of who Lucy Letby is. She's a neo former neonatal nurse, of course, charged with caring for these babies, convicted of sabotaging their care in some of the most horrifying ways, but not just because of her role, because of her personality as well, her character. And I think that's what I found most difficult to fathom really here. When you look at Lucy Letby's background and look to her character, which of course police detectives said that they did do, they couldn't identify anything in evidence and certainly in terms of how she presented herself. She came across as very calm, calculated, we've heard many a time from the parents, the prosecution, how cold calculated and cruel. She appeared very passive, no emotion. In fact, when you think of how many times Lucy Letby cried and got teary in court, it was only in relation to when she was talking about herself. And that's something that the prosecution barrister, Nick Johnson Casey, actually asked her directly about why she got emotional only when talking about herself, say when she was taken off duty as a nurse, uh, and not when talking about the babies. She also got very emotional when uh, a doctor, an unnamed marriage registrar known as 
Dr. A actually gave evidence behind a screen in court. When she heard his voice, she got up in the dock and tried to leave in tears. Now, this was the doctor that the prosecution alluded to a relationship or some sort of affair to which Lucy Letby had had with him and potentially uh, alluded to a motivation in the sense that she wanted to get his attention. The Prosecution Barrison Mitch Johnson KC said we well, accused her of having a crush on him, of being sweet on him, and crash bleeping in some sense of causing sorry these collapses in order to crash bleep him into the neonatal unit. Yeah, they'd had a weekend in London, hadn't they? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, there's a number of messages that uh, appeared in court that were found mm -hmm. on Lucy Letby's phone, exchanges between this doctor uh, and the neonatal nurse, uh, often mm -hmm. talking about some of these babies. They'd met up uh, a few times for coffee. They'd gone to London together. And in fact, on the notes found by police in the raid on her home, uh, she'd wrote next to his name, I loved you and I think you knew that. I wanted you to stand by me and you didn't. As well as the words, I don't think I'll ever marry or have children. Dowie, you gave crucial evidence at the trial. Could you please tell us what that evidence was? And did it go any way towards telling us why Letby did what she did? My role was the consultant paediatrician was to find out what caused the collapse, what caused the death uh, of these babies. And uh, <clears throat> I was asked by Cheshire Police to become involved and I asked them to provide me with the clinical notes of every baby during this 18-month period who had either collapsed or died, not just the ones whose collapses were unexplained or unexpected, um, but all of them. So I was able to exclude the ones whose death or collapse was due to the usual causes uh, that affect small sick babies, and that left me with uh, 15 uh, babies whose collapses could not be explained. There were features consistent with someone had given injected air into these babies' bloodstreams directly. That was the only explanation I could come to. And of course, it's virtually unheard of for this to occur accidentally because there are so many precautions in place because every nurse Every doctor knows of the danger of air getting into a bloodstream. So I had to conclude that someone had done this intentionally. And so what I told the police was, having identified these babies and the two insulin poisonings came later, uh, that they should look at the rotor, at the rotor of every nurse and every doctor who was on duty during this particular time. Because if a baby is placed in harm's way, that baby will deteriorate more or less immediately. So the injection of air into these babies was the most obviously, and shall we say the first detective of Letby's crimes, is that right? I think the first one was the injection of milk or milk and air directly through a nasogastric tube into the stomach. I think that she had done this on a number of the babies and in several babies she'd injected air or air and milk into the stomach, as well as finally uh, creating the final death, the final collapse, by injecting air into the bloodstream. So there was more than one uh, type of assault. And there were other babies who had direct physical assaults, which led to bleeding around the mouth and bleeding at the back of the throat. So, so there were all of these features uh, were, were present. The difficult problem, of course, was no one thought of air being injected into the bloodstream as the cause of these babies' collapses. And this is where the local medics got stuck. They'd realised that that it was associated with one particular nurse after the first four cases. But they could not take the next step and work out why the collapse had occurred. At any stage throughout your work on this case, did you have any reference to, or was there any learning that you took from the case of Beverly Allitt, another murderous nurse who was convicted back in 1991 of murdering four babies and seriously harming a number of others. No, there were big differences, actually. The, uh, all the Allard cases involved insulin. Uh, insulin poisoning in this case only occurred later. So this case was unique in many ways. And, of course, because you cannot 
carry out tests very easily to find out if a baby has received injection with air and there's very little scientific uh, information to, to help you. We had to rely on publications, some of which were over 30 years of age, uh, to back up the medical evidence. So the, the, the insulin poisoning uh, arrived purely by chance and this is thanks to the uh, careful investigation of Cheshire Police because uh, the two babies poisoned with insulin were the second of pairs of twins. And they asked me to have a look at the note simply to check everything. No one had considered insulin poisoning at that time. And I looked at the note simply assuming that there'd be nothing wrong with them. And I discovered this very, very high level of insulin in association with a low level of another substance called C-peptide. And that proves beyond doubt that they'd, uh, they'd received insulin uh, directly. Well, of course, the name Lucy Letby now is known far and wide. And Dr Raj, based on what Dow has told us and then what you've seen and heard about the case, who is Lucy Letby? Why did she do this? Well, it's a very, very important question if we're going to try to guard against it happening in the future. So in this particular case, we have no confession. This is a person who has maintained their innocence right to the end. And the first class of motivations you would look for is some obvious gain, some obvious payoff. And in several cases in the past, there has been an obvious gain. There isn't, perhaps, in this particular case. For example, there was a, a famous case in Brazil of a nurse who was killing uh, patients on their ward because there was a financial benefit. They were getting a kickback from a local funeral home because that funeral home alerted early that a patient had died on the ward, often an elderly, vulnerable patient, could contact the family early, earlier than other funeral homes, and therefore there was some kind of financial motivation. An obvious motive. Yes, yes. Um, there's one final one I want to mention of a Japanese nurse who was very upset with their pay and conditions, hated the hospital management, and wanted the hospital management to get into trouble. So they went on a killing spree, directly the attempt being to land the hospital management in trouble. Again, a clear motivation, a clear payoff. Now, when you get to a case like Lucy Letby and perhaps Beverly Allitt, where it's not obvious what the gain is, you're more into emotional territory. And one of the most common um, diagnoses in this case is what's referred to from the American academic literature as uh, a code blue junkie. Code blue is the US hospital term for an emergency code blue, where cardiac arrest team arrives on the rush uh, in order to revive a patient urgently who has had a cardiac or respiratory arrest. And the theory here, and by the way, there is a German nurse who's been convicted of over 80 uh, murders in this situation, who's been diagnosed as a code blue junkie, um, is that a particular nurse, often a nurse who is really good at their job, is getting off on the idea of bringing people back from the dead. So they create a resuscitation emergency or crisis because what they're really getting off on is the status in the hospital of being really good at bringing people back. And interestingly, in the Lucy Letby case, she was present on many cases where there was a resuscitation attempt. So the theory here is they're not getting off, and I do think the judge in making remarks that this nurse was a sadist, uh, was embarking into deep psychological territory, which I'm not sure the judge was qualified to make that comment. What's really going on in the theory of a code blue junkie is they're not getting off on the actual act of killing, they're getting off on the act of resuscitation. And the deaths in that case are a kind of very unfortunate side effect of that motivation. But finally, in the Beverly Allick case, for example, and with the Lucy Letby case, was there an emotional payoff? Um, this one theory is this was a woman in her 30s, didn't appear to have a long-standing relationship. Maybe the chances of her falling pregnant and being having children and a family of her own were beginning to disappear over the horizon. So one theory that has been mentioned by some psychiatrists and psychologists, because worldwide in every single case of a child being murdered by a nurse killer, it's all, the nurse has always been female. Actually, the number of nurses who end up being serial killers in terms of gender difference is roughly speaking equal, as many male nurses as female nurses. And often with male nurses, it's the elderly that they're killing. 
Why is it in every single case worldwide where a child has been killed at the hands of a nurse serial killer, there are always female nurses involved? And the theory here, I'm not saying I agree with the theory, I'm just telling you what the theory is, is that these women are harboring some unconscious hatred of mothers who can have children, people who can have a family, and there's a kind of unconscious resentment against that that is being acted out. Thank you. In recent criminal history, of course, Beverly Alley is the closest kind of case that we can compare to Lucy Letby. And now, Neil, you gathered some of the most important evidence that went a long way towards convicting Beverly Allitt. We heard that Letby had case notes from some of the babies at home. Did Allitt do anything similar to that? Yeah, there's, there's lots of similarities with the two cases in, in, in how they conducted themselves. Uh, uh, but. Beverly Allett, she had uh, um, allocation notes, she had ward round notes all at home. Uh, she falsified notes on the accounts. Um, but uh, Beverly, as, as the doctor said, that she was diagnosed with Munchausen. And from a small child, she'd been very difficult. She'd uh, found illness, she'd fallen off her bicycle. As she got older, she injected her breast with water, she put hot water in her mouth before they took a temperature. Uh, and she did all these things that brought attention to herself. And this is what she did on the ward. Uh, she'd uh, been 40 days sick uh, in her first year's training. They put her on a, a child's ward so she could complete her training. And of course, she became the saviour. She raised the alarm on numerous occasions when, when babies were, uh, were collapsing. And particularly with the insulin, uh, she identified with Paul Crampton. Uh, um, that he was hypoglycemic, and she uh, called the other nurse and said, should we do a BM stick? Well, people were a bit surprised. He was in there for diarrhoea and sickness. Uh, but, of course, she drew the attention. She saved him. They sent blood off, uh, and it came back at something like 500 millivolts per unit, which is massively over. The only reason it was 500 was because uh, uh, the machine had stopped at that level. But because they identified the problem, she was obviously treated with uh, uh, glucose and he's like a stick of rock and he recovered, but she attacked him three times. Eventually, I recovered blood from that child and it was 43,000 units of insulin that was in his body. And the other one, Becky Phillips, uh, was again 9,000 units. But so all the time, Beverly was trying to create attention to herself. She, like I think, let be, to be fair, created uh, a crisis and reveled in the drama of the recovery. Um, and that's probably the way it went forward. Is the female serial killing Lucy Letby nurse a psychopath? Well, the problem with that is it depends what you mean by the word psychopath. And um, a psychopath um, is a personality disorder well known in the literature and many criminals, um, the police here would have encountered psychopaths, have no remorse, no guilt, no empathy. Um, and they, they pursue their goals, and anyone who gets in the way of their goals, they, they crush them or polish them off. Um, and so it is clear that Lucy Let Me may have had psychopathic tendencies, but I don't think that theory really captures what's possibly going on here when you're dealing with someone who's getting some emotional payoff. Because another theory is that immediately after the death of a child on a ward, the clinical team bond. It's a heightened, intense emotional experience. And for someone who is a bit isolated, and maybe in the Beverly Allett case, for example, are they getting off on the increased emotional intensity and bonding that occurs? between colleagues immediately after a tragedy like this. Is there an emotional payoff? And that's what's going on. What could have been happening with the I am evil thing is that losing, apparently losing so many babies under her care may have made her begin to, to think hard about what's going on. Because one theory is that sometimes with in these cases, there isn't a direct conscious drive. With Beverly Allett, for example, very interestingly, um, going back to this emotional driver that maybe she was getting off on the emotional payoff and the attention she was getting, um, uh, one of the nurses famously said, after, before it was found out that she was guilty of these murders, Beverly has been a rock on the ward. She's always been present 
in the crisis. So do people create a crisis so then they can have a hero status, hero complex, God complex is another word that's been used. And what's interesting about the God complex theory is that it means that actually the kind of nurse serial killer we're talking about will be found amongst the much better nurses. The code blue junkie is actually probably the best nurse on your ward because they really, really believe in themselves, this hero complex, God complex, that they can bring anyone back. And that is one of the deeper questions as well about how health service systems are going to detect people like this. It's very difficult on a ward, I'm going to be very blunt about some of the difficulties the NHS faces, where if you have many nurses who are not competent or you're worried about their competency and you've got a few that are really, really good, you're not focusing on those ones as where the source of the trouble might be on your ward, but actually the God complex theory says it's the very best nurses on your ward that you want to worry about with this God complex motivation. It's very difficult to target the nurses you rely on best in an emergency as being the ones you have to think about with this very rare example of nurse serial killers, I think. Well, those who have responsibility for overseeing the staff ultimately are the NHS managers, those who sit at the very top of the tree in terms of running the hospital. Neil, with regards to Beverly Allitt, did you have many dealings with the management of the hospital and where did their kind of responsibility lie? Well, I was obviously assigned the medical evidence, so I was looking for samples more than anything else. Obviously, in the initial stages, this was handed to our superintendent who had meetings with the administrators. Um, and at that time, uh, this had been going on for over a month, uh, as I say, 59 days. The administrators at Grantham Hospital obviously were very reluctant to bring the police involved. Uh, they were getting pressure from the Queen's Medical Centre, Professor Hull, uh, to get the police involved. And also, you know, funeral directors were worrying. Suddenly you've got four child deaths on the ward uh, in, a, in a month when you'd get one a year. Uh, with coroner's officers, uh, the coroner, was concerned about the number of things that were coming in. So there was this reluctance on the administration to accept that it was a criminal in involvement. And equally with the paediatricians, one of them, uh, particularly with a, a little girl called Claire Peck, who was, uh, she was coming with asthma and, and she collapsed. They were preparing a drug called aminophilin, which uh, needs special attention. Beverly was left with a child and collapsed we found through the samples that she'd got 16 units of potassium in her body when it should be something much lower and doctors can probably tell me what it should be, about six, I think. Um, and we, as a, as a policeman, I was put off the fact of potassium was a potential killer because they said, oh, you know, potassium is released from the, the cells when you die and so this would be there anyway. But we found a bit of research in Finland uh, where they'd uh, done research on... Uh, on, on patients with hypothermia and noticed that it had never risen above 8 to 10 and then it had been very slowly. In this case, it was at 16 within an hour. That's a very interesting point. Did you, Dowie, rely on much learning from abroad or in the UK from previous similar situations? Most of the experience, uh, information I got was from the UK. The quality of baby care in the UK is as good as anywhere in the world. It really is excellent. Uh, a lot of the developments have taken place in uh, various centres across Britain. So one did not have to rely on uh, other information, really. Now, with regards to the management of the hospital, what's your opinion on the managers at the Countess of Chester when they alerted the police, when they got others involved? Do you think that was satisfactory or did it fall well short of what we should expect? I think their management was absolutely appalling, uh, quite frankly. Um, if this would be a shock to the public, um, which, you know, you know, you cannot... The NHS management cannot be trusted. Not a shock to somebody like me who's been working in the NHS for a long, long time and who spent over 30 years doing with cases of alleged clinical negligence. The default position of the manager usually is the cover-up. And those of us who deal with child abuse issues, we have the sentence, we, we describe parents who neglect their children as people who are unable to distinguish their own needs from the needs of their child. 
And I think managers are exactly the same. They're unable to distinguish their own needs from the needs of their patients. And in this case, they were unable to distinguish their own needs from the needs of the frontline staff, the, the doctors who were tearing their hair out trying to work out what was causing these collapses and these deaths. So they behaved absolutely awfully. They were, quite frankly, a disgrace. Thank you. Holly, tell us about Sir Duncan Nicholl, a name that many people might not be familiar with. Sir Duncan Nicholl uh, was the chair of the Countess of Chester Hospital at the time of Lucy Letby's murders. He was also, we believe, um, head of NHS England. At the time, Beverly Allett uh, can carried out her murders. Now, he claims that the hospital board were misled um, by hospital managers um, during Lucy Letby's case, essentially uh, claims that there was no uh, efforts to point to any criminality involving her at that time, following a number of reviews that were carried out by the hospital. The problem was those reviews didn't necessarily uh, focus on Letby's um, involvement in the unexplained number rise in fatal and near fatal collapses at the Countess. They were just looking at exactly what might be behind those deaths and near deaths, not let B's involvement, whether she was behind them at all. And we've obviously had a slew of reports now and accusations about how hospital bosses and managers handled all of this, why warnings were ignored, because we know that as early as June 2015, Dr Stephen Brewery, the head of the neonatal unit, identified an association between Letby and this inexplicable rise in the number of near fatal and fatal collapses after uh, two deaths and one uh, attempted murder within just two weeks at the Countess. And it wasn't until the tipping point uh, that Dowie mentioned earlier of the deaths of babies O and P that they insisted Lucy Letby be removed from the unit and even then there was pushback from managers. They say they had to resolutely resist attempts to have her back on the unit for the next 11 months following an external review which then identified there was no definitive explanation for these deaths. It wasn't until then that the hospital called in the police and they started their six year long investigation. The hospital have said that they have made significant changes since Lucy Letby was on the neonatal unit, that they are going to learn lessons, of course, as an independent inquiry, a judge led inquiry, so they can compel those hospital bosses to give evidence. Thank you all very much. Now, I would like to end this discussion on something that the then Secretary of State for Health, Mrs Virginia Bottomley, said in her statement about the circumstances surrounding the murders by Beverly Allitt to Parliament in 1994, only 21 years before Letby's first known killing. My concern is that it was the hospital management, supervised by the regional health authority, which hired her, failed to spot her character defects, failed to supervise her, <coughs> failed to act on numerous clues, and delayed inexcusably in calling in the police. She said, the least we owe these families is an explanation of how Alit's crimes went unchecked for so long and an assurance from which I hope they will be able to take some comfort that everything possible will be done to prevent such a tragedy ever happening again. She also said, The Clothier report identifies and criticises failures of management and communications in the hospital. And it is important that lessons are learned from these throughout the service. Well, clearly, just 21 years later, lessons weren't learnt. A similar pattern of offending was not prevented. And Letby went on to take all those lives and attempt to kill many other precious, tiny babies. I sincerely hope that both the Alit victims and the Letby victims' families will find it in their soul to grant me the mercy of forgiveness for mentioning this. But it's important, it's really important, that when politicians stand up and say something, they mean it and that lives are not lost again. Thank you.
Right, that's all we've got time for this week. Many thanks to Dowie, Raj, Holly and Neil. Be sure to leave us a comment, like and subscribe, and we'll be back next week for more Crime Suspects.